Hey guys, before we start this episode, I want to uh, very quickly promote my friend Barry James' book, Counting Stick Control. Barry is one of the last living students of George Lawrence Stone. He worked with Stone, I believe, back in the 50s, and um, he had all the information directly from Stone, primarily on how to actually count stick control. Stick control is one of the most famous books in history, but it does not include the count. Uh, some parts are easier and you can figure it out, but there's parts in the book where it gets to be a little bit crazy to try and do the counting in your head alone. So this book is a massive help for anyone who's trying to count through stick control themselves. The book on its own without knowing Barry is worth buying, but I will say that Barry has been um, battling cancer for a while now. So if you buy this book, Counting Stick Control from Barry for $25, it's $19.95 plus $5 shipping uh, in the US, and then just we can figure it out if you're outside of the US. Um, it directly supports his cancer treatment uh, for him and his family. And all the money goes to him. Uh, he prints it himself. He is mailing them himself. He's doing everything. So to get the book, though, I'm going to help out and kind of keep track of things a little bit on, on on my end through this. Email me at drumhistorypodcast at gmail.com. Again, drumhistorypodcast at gmail.com. And then I will connect you and give you the right PayPal account to send it to get to Barry. And I'll get your address to Barry and we'll, we'll make it work um, to make sure you get a book. So again, email me drumhistorypodcast at gmail.com. We'll get you the book and you are directly supporting Barry. So uh, I really appreciate everyone helping and considering it. And uh, now let's get on to the episode about 1960s drummers. Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Mr. Bob Cianci to talk about the great rock drummers of the 60s. Bob, welcome to the podcast. Bart, thank you very much for having me. So, um, Bob, let's just... This is a lot of cool stuff. Like like I mentioned with the title, you you wrote a book, Great Rock Drummers of the 60s. You wrote it in 1989. It was super popular. It went it it, it sold out. You it became a collector's item. There's a whole story there. Let's just hop in here and I know your story sort of corresponds with coming up at that time, learning about these drummers, then you know the 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 world of music changing. So just take it away and, and tell us about your beginning and the, all these great rock drummers. Sure. Well, I got interested in learning how to play drums when I was about 13. And I'd seen the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. And I wish I could say that that changed my life, but it really didn't. I, I didn't take the Beatles really seriously in the beginning. And part of the reason was I was really into my parents' big band records at the time. And uh, I was listening to uh, Glenn Miller and Tommy Dorsey and uh, liking that big band swing sound. And I, I guess I was a little, a little out of my time at that point. But, of course, we all listen to Top 40 radio, AM Top 40. And uh, it got to the point where that was really not what I wanted to listen to anymore. And about that time, we started getting an FM rock station in New York City that we could listen to. That was WORFM. And uh, I started listening to more of the British bands, the Rolling Stones, and then the Beatles were coming out with things that were uh, a little more interesting than yeah, 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 and I want to hold your hand. Yeah. And um, I started really getting in into the British bands. You know, I was listening to the Stones and... The, the, the kinks and you know the big, of course then the beatles and the who i saw the who on shindig which was a popular teen tv show on i think it was abc tv and i saw a video of the who playing i can't explain live and i saw keith moon and i went that's who i want to play drums like <laughs> that's the guy yeah you know, and then then I went back and discovered Charlie Watts and Ringo, but I started buying the records and buying forty fives, but buying albums really. And whenever I had any money, I'd go buy albums, and I ingested all this information about the drummers and just inhaled it. And I used whatever resources I could. I was reading, you know, the stupid rock magazines that were out then, like. 16 and tiger beat and all you know these silly magazines but they had information about the bands so I, I would do that and i found a candy store in a neighboring town 
that had Rave magazine. Rave magazine was a British import. It was a mod magazine. So I'd get on my bike once a month and ride to this candy store. It was like four miles away and buy Rave magazine. And it had articles about all these British bands. So by listening to the music, by reading album liner notes and magazines and so forth, I just built up this incredible amount of information about 60s rock drummers. And that became more and more and more as I went along. And um, my parents, uh, they had retired to Richmond, Virginia. And uh, having dinner or something, and I was talking to my mother. And she said, you know so much about these 60s rock drummers. Why don't you write a book? And I said, well, that's a pretty good idea. <laughs> <laughs> so it just so happened uh, that my wife and I were friendly uh, with another couple. And the husband owned a small music book publishing business. So I contacted him. I said, I've got this idea for a book. He said, well, my little music publishing company was just bought by Hal Leonard, biggest publisher of music books in the country. Sure. You called it the right time. So, okay. I told him what I had in mind. He said, write a chapter and an outline, get it to me, and let's see what we can do. So about two, three weeks later, I hand-delivered it to him, typed it on a typewriter. Of course, we didn't have computers um he liked it he sent it to hal leonard and three weeks later i had a contract wow he said get yourself a lawyer look <laughs> it over we did i did uh we made some changes and i got a book deal so easily that does not happen these days i mean you don't uh unless <laughs> but but really it's just a friendship it's through your friend but even now, I mean, I feel like publishing and everything is so hard. It would be nowadays you would do this online. It would be a blog. It would be something like that. But it's it's pretty cool. That's you're you're a lucky guy to make that happen. You know, exactly. I was very lucky. I just happened to be at the right place at the right time and know the right person. And I could have shopped this to any number of publishers and probably gotten thrown out the door. But I just happened to know the right guy at the right time. And he wanted it. Unbelievable. Well, Okay, so that's an amazing story of how it came to be. It's almost meant to be. But um, let's jump into the actual content of the book and the the '60s rock drummers, um, which I think it's it's been mentioned on the show a lot before. But you said you liked the big band stuff. I mean, what's 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 interesting, and I think you know people need to keep in their their mind is these rock drumming icons would have grown up with that kind of music. That would have been that's what right. they enjoyed and their parents listened to and and the gene krupas and the buddy riches and the joe jones and these these guys it would it it's it's what made them who they are so it makes sense you liked that well i think so um i know that ringo always liked swing music uh and you can hear that in his playing you know charlie watts was a jazz guy you could hear it in his playing sure and i think the british drummers had more of a tendency to like big band and american jazz more than the american drummers did hmm. and of course then the american drummers copied the british drummers so um yeah i think the gene krupas and the buddy riches and the joe joneses and the uh, Sid Catlett's and guys like that were a big influence on those drummers. Yeah. But then the, the world changes and, uh, it's less, I, I remember in the Keith moon episode I did, Tony Fletcher, I believe said that, uh, it was as if the world switched from black and white to color in the sixties, which, you know, in many ways it did with all of the, the, the vibrant colors and the hippie culture and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, so for starters, with the content of the actual, you know, 60s drummers, who would you put as the, like, this is the moment, this is the drummer that it, that it happened? I got to say Ringo. Yeah. Ringo was the bedrock of all of that. Um, before Ringo, what was there? <laughs> before the Beatles, what, what was there? Um, rock and roll was kind of in a state of uh, 
I don't know, flux. Uh, you know, you had teen idols. You had, uh, uh, there were artists out there that had integrity like Roy Orbison. Uh, mm -hmm. But when the Beatles came along, I always say you kind of had to be there and, yeah. and, and live through that hysteria that happened on February 9th, 1964. Watching the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, it was like they were four aliens from outer space. <laughs> we had never seen anything like that before. We never heard anything like that. Yeah. And I've, I've got to put Ringo right at the beginning of all of that. Sure. Because he inspired so many people. I mean, millions of people. Beatles changed everything. Yeah. I mean, even just from an industry standpoint, I think I heard something. It may have been, uh, you know, some hyperbole, but I think I, I heard someone talking about recently on how, how Zildjian had like 90,000 orders placed or something like that for symbols, which at first I'm thinking, oh my gosh, that's crazy. But then you're like, well, maybe that's not so crazy because Ludwig got so overwhelmed. So let's just go through then. And uh, who are the, like, who would you list let's make a little list then and we can kind of dissect each one the great rock drummers of the 60s like if you have to choose i think we we can kind of imagine our mount rushmore of of rock drummers and then i'm sure there's there's slightly lesser known ones and it can go forever but but who do you put in this great you know the greats the greats well ringo number one mm -hmm. charlie watts keith moon bobby elliott from the hollies Kenny Jones from the Small Faces. Yep. Hal Blaine. How could you not have Hal Blaine? Yeah. He's almost someone you wouldn't put on the rock drummer list, but of course he is because of all of his work on so many different songs that, uh, you know, he just kind of played in the background. And But I love Hal. I mean, he, of course, belongs on that list. Liberty DeVito once said, I found out that 10 of my favorite drummers were Hal Blaine. <laughs> yep. You have to say also Ginger Baker. Sure. Um, Dino Danelli, one of the real, real top guys. Yeah. And of course, I interviewed Dino. I had lunch with him one day in New York City. Went back to his apartment about a week or so later. We did the interview there. And he was a um, very friendly guy, but very um, kind of a hermit. <laughs> uh you know, lived in a very small studio apartment over by Central Park. Um, a little enigmatic, you might say, kind of kept to himself, yeah. very private. Um, Johnny Barbada from the Turtles and Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young and Jefferson Airplane and Starship. And he grew up about two towns away from me in New Jersey. Um, well, let's see, let's. Let me open the book sure, and we'll, and we'll take a look here. Well, and while you're looking, I'll say that there's some guys like that where like maybe I haven't heard of them because in my I'm different generation, but and I've done a, I mean, I've watched a lot of drum videos and I've done a lot of research on a lot of different drum topics, but it's like there's so many iconic people who maybe don't get their mention because they didn't live the fast lifestyle. They didn't, you know, Keith Moon and John Bonham just become icons for not great reasons but they deserve um you know they deserve praise and there's i love that i love looking on the internet at, at old drum solos and finding someone you go who is that i've never heard of that person and they're a monster player there's tons of them out there one of the reasons i wrote this book was to give credit to some of these guys who never got the credit yep bobby elliott was one of them and I have to mention Jerry Edmonton from Steppenwolf. Yes, love Steppenwolf. Jerry was a huge influence on my drumming. I love Steppenwolf, and, and I loved his playing. And I got to interview Bo um, Jerry and get to know him. But again, just looking at my table of contents, uh, Carmine Peace, Nick yep. Avery of the Kinks, Michael Stewart Ware. Have you ever heard of Michael Stewart Ware? I don't think so. You've heard of the band Love, haven't you? Yes. He was the drummer, not the first drummer, but from the second album, second album, third album. Mm. He was the drummer in Love. 
from California. Hmm. Um, Mitch Mitchell. How can we forget Mitch Mitchell? Yeah. 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 He, he, Mitch Mitchell has, uh, so one of the most popular episodes of the podcast that's on, on YouTube, uh, on the audio as well, but there was a Mitch Mitchell episode that didn't even have video. It was just us talking. It was before I did video and, uh, man, that people loved that episode, but Mitch Mitchell, I learned a lot about him and, uh, and his incredible plane. And he, he's one of those people who, um, people are just super passionate about his style. It's the mix of the swing style and and it's like it's that it's like a cross generational transitional period of technique and style where you're getting the 50s and then you're getting the 60s and then you're going into the 70s and it's all a big you know gumbo <laughs> of yeah. like different styles mitch was influenced by the bop drummers elvin jones mm -hmm. and tony williams the same way that Charlie Watts was. Now their styles were nothing alike. Charlie was more of a straight ahead player, but Mitch took a lot of chances. And I absolutely love Mitch's playing. I remember when I got the first Jimi Hendrix album and played it and I said, Oh my gosh, this drummer's incredible. Yeah. I just loved his playing. And in the band I'm in now, occasionally, you know, we do a, a few Hendrix tunes and for a while we were doing uh Wait Till Tomorrow we had a bass player on the band that sang that and i always loved mitch's drum breaks on that and the drum breaks on little wing oh my god oh yeah it's it's hard to put into words just how it's you can hear it there's something special when you can hear it and like immediately know who it is obviously those are like some of the most famous songs in the world but you could probably just like hear isolated drum tracks on maybe a lesser known track and go, Oh, that's Mitch Mitchell. Oh yeah. Very yeah. recognizable. Yeah. Very recognizable. Ian Pace is another one who I've grown to really like, um, because the, his work with deep purple, it's just like you, I've seen some different videos where you go like, you know, a, a lot of these guys really know what they're doing as far as like rudiments and, uh, and being taught kind of the right way. Not that there's a wrong way, but, um, like coming up very, very, um, I don't know, well educated. And you can, you can tell that they use that in their drumming, but Ian Pace, especially, I think is just a monster drummer who it's sort of both, both sides. He, he's very well respected in, in, in our circles, but maybe, you know, the name doesn't get thrown around at the kitchen table, just like Buddy Rich and John Bonham, like everyone knows, but, um, incredible player. Oh yes. Ian was always overshadowed i think by john bonham bonham is a household name and ian pace i prefer his playing but one thing to keep in mind is that ian pace i i have a little section on him in the book but he's not really a 60s drummer he got started in the 60s but his heyday was the 70s yeah, that's you know? interesting. Yeah, yeah, you know? and even Bonham could fall into that category because yes, he did. I mean, Zeppelin was like what sixty eight, sixty nine, then sixty nine to to eighty. Yeah, so so that's an interesting point. But but if you then put it, I mean, just to kind of discuss it, if we're talking about the beginning of this boom being with the Beatles on Ed Sullivan in like sixty four, then it's like there's a pretty small window for these mm -hmm. you know iconic sixties rock drummers, which. What a special time. Let's talk about drum sets a little bit because um, they, they clearly changed uh, from from being a rock, you know, drum world where they, they grew. You'd obviously have like, um, I mean, I, I feel like four piece sets were pretty common before Ringo, before Charlie Watts. I think of like, you know, Max Roach would be playing it. They, they'd obviously have different variations, but like they got bigger. How did you see that progression go? Well, of course, Ringo has always played a four-piece set. Charlie Watts always played a four-piece set. You saw drummers adding a second floor, Tom, mm -hmm. like Jim Krupa did. Yep, and Buddy. Yeah, Buddy. And Johnny Barbada had two floor toms. Um, Dave Clark had two rack toms. Just about all of us started on a four-piece drum set. That's mostly what we had. You had a five-piece set available, and the 
Slingerland catalog or the Ludwig catalog, but most of us started with four pieces. And I think it was guys like Keith Moon who started adding, who started adding more drums. Pretty soon he had four rack toms and two bass drums and two floor toms and multiple cymbals and climb on a piece was very instrumental in going with bigger drums. He was one of the pioneers of that big drum thing. Yep. Um, Carmine always said, well, you know, Led Zeppelin was an opening act for uh, Vanilla Fudge. Sure. And he saw my Ludwig set with the big toms and the big bass drum. And he wanted the same thing. He said, I called Ludwig and hooked it up for him. Of course, Ginger Baker used four tom toms and two bass yeah. drums, and he had many cymbals stacked. And uh, so he was a pioneer of that yeah. multiple drum kind of thing. Yeah, Nick Mason, Pink Floyd, using more of your spread out, you know, two two bass drums. But I've seen him a lot with. I think it was in that live at Pompeii. It was like one tom in the middle, might have been two, but then two floors, which they're bigger drum sets but it's kind of neat to see just like one tom <laughs> in the middle of that monster set but i think the finishes were pretty cool as well you have keith moon uh kind of um getting more interesting with with uh, what is it the pictures of lily uh finish on his drums and then mm -hmm. there's a lot of sparkles a lot of different things white marine pearl seems to be going a little bit uh that's a little bit maybe their dad's drum set so they were getting a little more experimental with that too well, sure. White Marine Pearl was always associated with Gene Krupa and Buddy Rich and the swing drummers. That was the, the, the popular finish uh, yeah. back in the 40s and the 50s. And when I started, it was sparkle finishes. Um, of course, Ludwig had their oyster finishes. After Ringo appeared on Ed Sullivan, they had so many orders for Black Oyster Pearl drums and just drums in general that Ludwig was running 24 hours a day yeah to fulfill orders all right Bob well let's talk about some specific drummers um I want to preface this with everyone always has a favorite different drummer so there's a probably a lot of really specific kind of uh drummers that may not get mentioned today but leave them in the comments if you're watching on YouTube your favorite 60s drummers um if you're watching this on YouTube but Bob, let's talk about some some of the icons. Um, there's been an episode on a lot of these, but I'd like to hear kind of. It's just fun to talk about them. One of my favorites. I was had the pleasure of meeting him in 2019. Let's talk about Charlie Watts because he's kind of a different kind of a different beast, really. He's he's got uh, he's got his own style it completely. He's pretty mellow dude in general. But let's talk about Charlie. He was, was. Um, you know Rich King. Mm -hmm. Rich is a friend of mine. Um, I was finding drum sets, vintage sets for Rich when he worked for that music store down in Annapolis, Maryland. And so we got to know each other. And Charlie was appearing at the Blue Note in New York City with his jazz group. And Rich said, come into the city. I think I can introduce you to Charlie. Of course, this is after the book was published. Yeah. I, of course. So I drove into New York. Uh, we went to Charlie's hotel. And Rich was waiting to go up to see Charlie. He said, I can't take you up, but I will take you to the Blue Note. You can meet Charlie at the Blue Note. So I waited. Uh, Rich was up there for a half hour. He came down. We went to the Blue Note. And Charlie, by the time we got there, Charlie had been there. Uh, was finishing his sound check with his group hmm. playing all Charlie Parker material. He loved Charlie Parker. Yeah. And, and, and I remember Charlie coming out with an alto sax in the beginning and squealing into it <laughs> and then <laughs> took it off and got behind the drums. And, but be, before their set started, Charlie came over and I was introduced and he said, oh, how do you do? Very <laughs> proper English gentleman. Oh, yeah. I, I gave him a copy of the book, and I, I thanked him for all the inspiration he had given me over the years and the great playing. And he said, did you sign it? 
I said, oh, of course I signed it, Charlie. And we had our picture <laughs> taken together, which is up on my wall now. Of course. So we stayed. We listened to the group. They were, they were very good. And Charlie played great, uh, really great jazz. Jazz player didn't even play a four-bar break. Just played time. Mm -hmm. I'm driving home, and I'm thinking, Charlie Watts asked me for my autograph. <laughs> Something is wrong with this picture. <laughs> I'm driving, you know. Yeah, that's what? Charlie, though. <laughs> I mean, he he's the most humble, modest guy. Where, but he's really a, 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 the the exact definition of kind of that crossover from jazz to rock drummer. Where I feel like he just sort of like, and in my experience meeting him that one time was like, he was just like, you know, yeah, the Stones. I'm more interested in jazz. I mean, he had his jazz books. He had all his stuff and. That is so cool that you gave him a book, though, because I feel like he it's not just like something where he, you know, it gets lost on the plane on the way home. You know what I mean? I mean, he loved that stuff. That's huge. Well, I, I hope he read it. I hope he enjoyed it. You know, I never got to talk to him again. Yeah. But um, it was a very interesting experience to meet him. Absolutely. All right. So then give us another drummer. Let's you, you, your choice. Pick another 60s drummer, someone you interviewed uh, for the book that you think is uh, an interesting story. Gino Donnelly, who I regret. Let me say that I very much regret. I had people recommend him. I very much regret not speaking to Dino and, and getting him on the show when I could. Uh, so that was a that was a miss on my part. Very sad. Um, as I said, I got to know Dino. When the Rascals toured in 1988, I was able to get a backstage pass and spoke to Dino again after the book had been published, gave him a copy. Interesting story. When I was over at Dino's apartment, he was in the middle of having the apartment painted. Hmm. So there wasn't a lot of furniture. I guess he had his furniture in storage. So we were sitting on the floor. Hmm. And he goes, Come on out in the back. I uh, want to show you something. He lived on the ground floor, and he had a patio out in the back. And there were two green garbage bags. And he starts going through the one garbage bag, and he's pulling out pieces of broken hardware and, and cracked symbols. And he pulls out a red sparkle Roger snare drum with the bread and butter lugs. And he said, this was the drum that I had when I started the Rascals. Wow. I, I recorded the whole first album with this drum. Good loving. The whole first album. And he said, you think you might want it? And I said, yeah, I want it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what do you want to do? What do you want? Well, you, tell me what you want. You won't, well, let me think about it. And Dino was hard to get on the phone. I had his phone number, and he would never answer the phone. He had an answering machine. Sometimes he would call me back. Sometimes he wouldn't. Sure. But a couple of weeks went by, and I called. I left a message. I said, Dino, what do you want to do about the snare drum? Didn't hear from him. Called him a couple of weeks later. I want the snare drum. Let's talk. Never heard from him. I finally sat down and wrote him a letter. I said, Dino, I really want this drum. <laughs> Um, just tell me what you want. What do you want to do? Never heard from him. Years went by. I heard he sold it to the Hard Rock Cafe. Mm. Anyway, several months ago, this drum showed up on Reverb. And the top head was autographed to Don. And I have a feeling it was Don Bennett. Sure. Well, I think the drum wound up in Don Bennett's stable. His vault, yeah. <laughs> and there was somebody, the seller on Reverb is out on Long Island. And he's asking, I think, close to $7,000 for it. Which Man. I'm not sure. <laughs> No, but he really hung that kind of carrot out there for you to kind of like go after, but Jeez, Louise, that you must have been just thinking. I mean, I, I know that feeling of kind of like, yeah, I want it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. And uh, 
clearly he, you know, later on in life, I'm sure that was a good, maybe the hard rock cafe or whatever could have paid a lot more than an individual would have paid, which obviously you don't blame the guy for taking going that route, but not fun for you. No, I, I, I just wanted him to tell me, just give me an idea. How can I acquire this from you? But I didn't even get that. So yeah. it, what it was, it, you know, I was not meant to have it, but I just thought it was very interesting that it showed up years and <laughs> decades later on reverb, you know, for all that money. So, yeah, yeah, no, that's it, interesting. And it's funny. It was just in a kind of, you know, I'm sure it was the, the bag was just outside of his place because of the painting, but it's just interesting. He had all this stuff just piled in there <laughs> like that outside. I mean, this drum that's worth all this money is sitting in a garbage bag outside. I, I was amazed. Yeah. Do you have other collectible drums that you've acquired? Is that something you do? Well, I did. Um, and I wound up selling, selling what I had. Mm -hmm. Um, Jerry Edmonton sent me a Ludwig superphonic 400 that he used with Steppenwolf and, Mm. and, and he autographed the head. Cool. And I had it for years and years, and I, I finally wound up selling it, but I kept the head. I kept the head. Nice. Now, one thing that I do have that is very cool, I I like the 13th floor elevators. You ever heard of them? I've heard of them, I, and I've probably heard, I'm assuming assuming they have like a couple big hits that is the reason I would, I would remember the now, name. The song that you would know is called You're Gonna Miss Me. That, yeah. that was their only thing that came close to being a hit you're going to miss me by the 13th floor elevators and i got to know their drummer john ike walton they did a reunion concert in 2015 back in the 60s john ike had a drum head that was painted it was a very psychedelic kind of thing and he had another head painted for the front of the bass drum for that one concert I bought it and I have it. Cool. So that's that, awesome. Yeah. That's something I, that's not going anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, that's a, that's a world that has gotten very expensive. The collecting of these, these, uh, I'm sure it was expensive before. I mean, it's iconic. Like you're not going to buy Charlie Watts, you know, symbols or something for, for inexpensive any, at any point. But now it seems like it's gotten astronomically expensive. Well, John Ike was very fair. Uh, I bought the head for 250 bucks. That's not bad. <laughs> That's not no. bad at all. <laughs> it's very fair. Yeah. And I, I called him after the show and he said, yeah, I got this, you know, the front bass drum head. I'm, I I uh, want to sell it. I said, well, how much you want? He goes 250 bucks. I said, sold. Yeah. I'll send you a check. Easy. <laughs> That's not bad yeah, at all. It was easy. Yeah. Very easy. Um, all right. So give us, uh, who else did you get a chance to, uh, you know, meet and speak with for the book? And, and you kind of told me when we were off, off air for a second that you would send tape recorders to people with a cassette tape, which I think is really a neat way to do it because sometimes the scheduling of interviews and, and you're not doing really, uh, like what we're doing where it's all going to be live. You were doing, you just needed their content, which is a neat way to do it. Right. Well, as I said, I would send them cassettes record your answers, send it back. And when I revised the book in 2006, it was a little easier to do it. Number one, because we had the internet and I had that at my disposal. Mm -hmm. And I was able to get in touch with uh, Michael Stewart Ware. He lives out in Lake Tahoe. I had talked to Sandy Nelson pretty um, extensively. Um, I had talked to Kenny Jones. In fact, Kenny Jones called me one morning. I was getting ready to go to work, and the phone rang, and my wife picked it up. Kenny Jones is on the phone. <laughs> I thought, okay. Wow. And he wanted a couple extra copies of the book. Um, I was not able to speak to Ringo. Mm-hmm. See, I had three sections of the book. Uh, the first section was profiles. And these were articles mainly on drummers um, who I could get in touch with, you know, Although there were exceptions to that. And then I had a section called very special mentions. 
this was Ginger Baker, uh, Mitch Mitchell, Ringo, Charlie Watts, uh, guys who I couldn't get in touch with mm-hmm. you know, for one reason or another. Um, and the way I found a lot of these guys was to contact either their record companies or their management. And that's what I did with the Hollies. I contacted their management. They put me in touch with Bobby Elliott. Uh, and then there's a section called honorable mentions and I, it says the good, the bad and and the missing in action. (laughs) And these are all the drummers who I did not write a chapter on, but I wrote a little paragraph, uh, or a larger paragraph, depending on who they were. Sure. Um, when I revised the book in 2006, I completely did the honorable mention section over again because now I had the internet. And I was able to look up, okay, the drummer in the Jay Giles band or the drummer in uh, whoever. Uh, here, let's see if I can come up with one. Yeah, the drummer in The Move, the British band, Bev Bevan, who went on to play with uh, Electric Light Orchestra. Uh, Jimmy Carl Black, who was the drummer in The Mothers of Invention. Uh, Brian Bennett, who was the drummer in The Shadows. Yeah. The British band. Sure. Um, and, and I was able to flesh out these little mini bios much better because I had the internet. Yeah. So in your experience of talking to a lot of these guys, I feel like it, it's pretty common with music where, oh, if you're in a band that's really big in the 60s, that doesn't mean that in some cases that you are in a huge band in the 70s, 80s, 90s through the rest of your life. Uh, with the exception of the the major, you know, iconic ones that we all know who were in your middle section where even a guy writing a book a really with how Leonard can't get in touch with them. Uh, what was a common trajectory for drummers that would be in a band, let's say, that had a couple hits in the 60s? I mean, was it typically that you would just keep gigging throughout the rest of your life and kind of make ends meet? Or did you run into it where people would then get kind of straight jobs and uh, you know what I mean? Like, what would what would people be doing if, if it didn't last for 40 years? Whatever they could. Yeah. Some people stayed in music. Some people didn't. Uh, some people moved to behind the scenes jobs. Some people died. Yeah, sure. It's sad, but true. <laughs> you know, and, and, and that's happening more and more now with these guys, you know, uh, vis-a-vis Jeff Beck. I mean, yeah. of course, he's not a drummer, but Jeff Beck, my God. No, of course, yeah. That was a hard one. That was a hard one to deal with because I was a big Yardbirds fan. Yeah. And um, I still am. And I got to know Jimmy McCarty, the drummer from the Yardbirds. Mm. And now we're on a first-name basis. I go see the Yardbirds every time they're in the area, you know? Yeah. And even got to jam with them one night in a oh, wow. club in New York City. Yeah, I got to play with the Yardbirds one night. I was looking around, and I'm going, I'm playing with the yard birds. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Once awesome. again, what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, it's hard incredible. work, hard work, right place, right time, uh, being a good hang, you know, um, all that really. And being, you know, it, it, I feel like with doing what you did and, and have done with this, the, with the book, you, you don't, you can't be drooling and like, you know, like too just over the top with it. So clearly you were respectful and had good questions and, and all that good stuff. And uh, it's it's pretty neat. I mean, it's it's an iconic time, without a doubt. I think the 60s rock drummers and especially I mean, there's a lot of American ones, but the British, the British invasion kind of I think for a lot of people is what they think of with those famous those those Brits coming to America. Absolutely. Absolutely. Funny, though, um, when the book was published for the second time. Hal Leonard had a a publicity girl, and she was a real go-getter. And she lived in New York City. She played bass in a punk band. And um, she set up several phone interviews for me with small market FM classic rock stations, mostly out in the Midwest, you know, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio. And I'd go on the radio with these classic rock jocks and, you know, for five minutes or so. Mm -hmm. Inevitably, they would say to me, okay, who was the greatest 60s rock drummer? (laughs) And they all did it. Yeah. And my answer was Ringo. 
and they were mystified. Ringo, I didn't think Ringo was that good. I, you know, I thought Ringo kind of like hitched his wagon to a to three really talented guys. I said, no, no, no. Yeah. Ringo had, and he still does, has great time. He has a great feel. Mm -hmm. He does what is necessary to make the music work. He doesn't do anything that's unnecessary. And he inspired millions of kids to pick up drumsticks. He was yeah. the Gene Krupa of the rock era. Yeah. And that's why Ringo was the greatest rock drummer of the 60s. When they were expecting, like, you know, of course you want to hear, everyone probably assumed you were going to say, like, John Bonham or something like that. Because of that drum solos and it's classic rock stations and they think ginger baker or mitch mitchell which they are iconic but um that's it's just like you can't first off that question we all know as drummers is just sort of a silly question where it's like you know everyone sort of rolls their eyes like uh, like this being a drumming podcast i would never really even think to ask that but joe schmo on the radio of course goes you know you know bob who's the best <laughs> and you gotta you know come up with that's an answer why that's why they were mystified at my response yeah and i say you know ringo from a technical standpoint didn't have the chops of a buddy rich or a, a, a ginger baker or a carmine apiece but he did what was perfect yeah. he did what was what needed to be done and i always think the uh you know i always think the the switched thing where he was left-handed, but he grew up playing a right-handed set. Cause I think his grandma or someone was like, no, you need to play it like this. So mm -hmm. he has that whole mixed up, which hand is leading style, which makes for the most interesting kinds of fills like that, where him and Charlie, like we said, are very, um, uh, they're polarizing where they're legends icons, but they're in the same era. They're in the same category as, Ginger Baker and Mitch Mitchell and Keith Moon, but they're so different. There's there's room for everyone, <laughs> you know. We all approach the drum set differently. No two no two drummers play alike. And I'm a big Little Feet fan, and I love, love Little Feet Haywards. I yes. love Richie Haywards drumming, and I knew Richie and um. We had gone to see him in a theater up in Westchester County, New York, and he goes, "I got a new DW set. Come on, I want to show it to you." So he took it. He took me up to uh, onto the stage, and let let me play them. And he goes, "Yeah, you know, none of us play the same way. You know, just a very offhanded comment, but it was it was correct." And also, I know that Charlie Watts once said that to Kenny Jones. Did you know that Kenny Jones? played drums on the song it's only rock and roll the rolling stones tune i had somehow heard that or seen that somewhere and then was like i gotta look into that and then i never he looked did. into it wow kenny jones played drums on it's only rock and roll hmm. and he was in the studio with the stones and charlie couldn't get there or something so they said here kenny you play and so he laid down the drum track and they used it and later he said i apologize to charlie he said, "Now nah, it's all right. You sound like me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it does. Like, honestly, from from being a big Stones fan, too, it's like you you hear that. And even going back to the Beatles, there's like something where someone someone might say, oh, that's Paul on drums. And you're like, well, I didn't really notice. You know, I didn't it didn't stick out. But Kenny Jones is an interesting fellow where, um, you know, filling in with the who and uh, taking over. You know what Kenny Jones told me? He said. So, of course, I was very good friends with Keith. I was with Keith the night before he died. Mm -hmm. And after he died, Bill Kirbishley, who was the Who's manager, called me. He said, come in for a meeting with the band. And he said, we sat around for a while and drank some wine and reminisced about the old days. And then he said, Pete went, you have to join the band. You're one of us. You're a mod. He, Kenny said, I didn't want the blankety blank gig to me. He said, but the money was so good <laughs> that I couldn't turn it down. And he said, I was in the process of starting a band with some American players 
And he, he, he finally said, okay, I've got to go talk to these guys and see what they say. And he did. And, and they all said, Kenny, the who just asked you to join the band. You have to do it. Yeah. Just do it. Yeah. So he did. And he said, but I told them I don't play like Keith. Don't expect me to try to be the next Keith moon. He said, I'll, I do what I do. He said, there are certain drum parts that are uh, necessary to the songs and I will try to recreate those, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to be Keith moon. No, it's different. Well, because if you're trying to be him and then you you're never going to live up to it completely because because what the great quote you just said, we all play differently. We're all different. But uh, and I don't think Zach Starkey plays like exactly like Keith. I think they're all different. In 2008, I went to the NAMM show in Anaheim and I was in the premier drum booth and the guy there said, Mandy Moon is going to be here tomorrow hmm. they were rolling out the pictures of lily reissued drum set yeah and he said mandy's going to be here tomorrow i said i would love to meet mandy moon so i went back the next day and sure enough there was mandy moon she looked just like keith so much like him i thought yeah. i was looking at keith moon <laughs> and i talked to her for i don't know about 10 minutes and one thing that she said to me was, my father had undiagnosed issues. Yeah. And, and they were never addressed. If he had lived, maybe they would have been addressed. Now, that's really all she said about it. Yeah. I mean, that this whole topic of rock drummers of the sixties, it's almost like these guys in a way were like the Guinea pigs of like, like let's make our, let's be, let's put these icons up on a pedestal. They, they party so hard. They can take drugs. They can drink. They can, you know, live this extreme lifestyle, but it killed a lot of them. A lot of them suffered from it. And, and if you, if you mix that with some possible underlying mental undiagnosed problem, it's a recipe for disaster, but uh, I guess now we have that as a, it's like a case study of like what, what can go wrong when you go that far. And those guys did it. John Bonham, classic exactly. example, classic example, drank himself to death. Yep. Yep. Well, it is what it is. I mean, and then again, that's, uh, and again, that's just sort of a, uh, that's the dark side of things, which these guys lived great lives. They, you know, when they were alive, it was a fast rock and roll lifestyle, but not all of them were party animals who, who passed away. I think that's obviously it's worth saying that though. There's a lot of guys who, who went on to have great careers, like you said, with other things and continuing to drum and become icons and legends, um, for, for many years to come. So Bob, why don't we, as we wrap up here, you want to tell people the best place to find the book? Uh, and obviously, there was a revised version, so tell them which one to get and all that good stuff. Well, you would be better off to get the revised edition. It's better. As, as I said, I had the internet at my disposal when I revised it, so it's got a lot more information. Uh, the, as far as I know, I know you can get it on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Now, there's probably other places online that you could find it but they've got it on amazon and i would say get the revised edition um when we decided to revise the book and the reason we did it is because i found out that the book was going for two and three and four hundred dollars the first pressing and i said i called my publisher and i said hey we got to do this book again <laughs> so i revised it um I got an advance, uh, you know, this time I was able to do it on a computer and email it over and, um, the book came out again and didn't sell as well as the first one. So there, there are copies out there, but I, but I'd say go to Amazon, get the revised edition. Yep. Yeah, that makes sense. That happens though. I mean, it was out, it was the boom, the revised it's more, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't change anything. It's still a great book. Um, and you should Thank be you. proud of, uh, I mean, it becoming a collector's item. You, you, you clearly, I'm sure you burst the, uh, the guy's bubble who had it up for sale for $500 or something by <laughs> now you can get it on More Amazon power to him. If he got that kind of money for it, I, 
Yeah, I didn't no, make anything off it. No, that, that's a common tale that I hear about books is it's just but but this needs to be out there. There needs to be a book. Mm -hmm. You can think of some kid who's going to the school library and he goes, oh, great rock drummers of the 60s. And he opens it. And who knows what that kid will be? You know, <laughs> he could be the great rock drummer of the 2030s or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because, uh, you know, I talk to guys online on drum forums and uh, there's this one guy. And he's asked me about four times, when are you going to write a book on 70s rock drummers? Well, you know, I'm not. I'm yeah. not. And the, and the reason I'm not, well, number one, I, I don't have as much knowledge. I could get the knowledge if I wanted to. Yeah. Publishing a book these days, there's not enough money in it anymore to make it worth all the work. Sure. And I would probably self-publish it anyway and incur the cost of publishing it. Um, so I choose not to, I choose not to, I did it. I did it twice. I'm happy with that. And yeah. that's, well, let it stay that way. Yeah. Completely understandable. You don't need to do a series and then it'd be, and it'd be Bob, when's the rock drummers of the eighties coming out? <laughs> let it, let it be. <laughs> let it be is right. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, um, well, Bob, this is great. I'll put per usual, everyone listening, I'll put a link in the description, um, of, uh, where you can get the book. I see it for sale on Amazon right now for 1291, which I'll put that there pretty cheap. Of course, you know, it's, it's a must have for any drummers, uh, collection of books. So, uh, Bob, thanks for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. You, you sharing your knowledge and, and, and being a guest on the show. Bart, thank you for having me on. I really enjoyed it.